if you have more countries adopting Bitcoin, and you once said that once this trend goes beyond a few countries, that that's going to create a domino effect. So wh what do you get from this move that Malaysia is looking into it and these uh, speculations out there that Honduras could be next? So the trend started exactly a year ago. You'll recall that at the Bitcoin 2021 conference in Miami, there was a big announcement and the big announcement at the time was that uh, President Nayib Bukele dialed in and he made the announcement that uh, El Salvador would be um, declaring Bitcoin legal tender in the country. I then went to visit El Salvador and we went to, to see the, the, the um, to see how they were implementing it, etc. Now we are exactly a year later and it seems that this experiment in one country has worked. I mean, it's too soon to say if it works economically, but we do know statistically that people are using the wallets, that the country has a great approval rate, that it's it's all it's it's bringing in a new kind well, of tourism. It was officially adopted in September. It was announced in June of last year. Bitcoin Miami is early this year. It's in April, but I believe officially adopted in September. So not quite a year yet from either the announcement or the adoption. Just to be clear there. Yep. But we are, but we are seeing that that so far at the early stage for a proof of concept first country, this has worked pretty well. And there are rumors, it's speculation at this stage, that a second country is going to make an announcement at Bitcoin 22, 2022 in Miami next month. So there is a, and and the speculation is that that's going to be Honduras. We have, uh, we saw as well that this this uh, government official in Malaysia that, that brought this up today, but I'm not sure how significant that was because it seemed to me like it was quite a small party with uh, with a proposal. The proposal read very well. Um, it was very encouraging, but I'm not sure that it, it's anything significant yet. I think the main thing that happened though was that El Salvador fought the battle with the United States, with the IMF. You'll recall that there was a lot of friction between El Salvador and the IMF uh, when El Salvador wanted to take financing and you know the IMF kind of urged them or warned them not to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. You'll also recall that El Salvador was downgraded by some of the ratings agencies when Bitcoin took a plunge. And so now any country that wants to adopt Bitcoin kind of has a roadmap of what's about to happen and they can make a, an informed decision which they, which they couldn't make a year ago. And there are countries in the world, we're seeing progress every day, Honduras is one of them, but Argentina had a, an incident, I think about a week ago, where they were going to take a loan from the IMF and one of the conditions of the loan from the IMF was that they wouldn't adopt Bitcoin at le as legal tender. And as far as I understand, Argentina pushed back on that. And so what we're seeing is that slowly, slowly, all these, there's becoming a roadmap for countries that want to adopt Bitcoin. and. Given what's going on right now in the world with rampant inflation and the US dollar as the reserve currency, I wouldn't be surprised if next year or yeah, I think probably 2023 is the year of country adoption of Bitcoin. We've seen a couple of waves of Bitcoin. We saw the retail adoption, the early adopters, then we saw retail adoption of Bitcoin. Then now we're starting to see institutional adoption of Bitcoin because the infrastructure exists for institutions to adopt Bitcoin. And I think you mentioned it earlier uh, when we started the show, you said Ray Dalio's fund, which is a $150 billion fund, Bridgewater's $150 billion fund, is now for the first yeah. time dabbling in crypto assets or talking about dabbling in crypto assets. Um, and so I think that that was the institutional adoption. And I think that next year, 2023, is probably going to be the year of country adoption or nation adoption. I think that's when we're going to see multiple dominoes fall um, when that happens. All right, 2023, the year of countries adopting Bitcoin on a faster pace as a legal tender. Well, we did see, speaking of countries, we did see a move out of Ukraine, which of course is embroiled in this terrible conflict with Russia at the moment. But in the middle of all of this, Ukraine passed a law that creates a legal framework for the cryptocurrency industry. Ukraine also has received over $100 million in crypto donations during this time. And this has brought to light a lot of the narratives that are associated with Bitcoin. You touched on inflation. Jerome Powell uh, saying that he's going to try and rein inflation, hike, uh, expecting a 50 basis point hike at the next meeting. So we're, we're seeing Bitcoin really tested as a safe haven, as a means to keep your wealth, store your wealth, take it as an inflation hedge. What would you say the Russia-Ukraine war has meant for some of those Bitcoin narratives? 
I think this year has been an incredible year for Bitcoin. It's had a lot of challenges and it's uh, and it's had a lot of triumphs. Um, it's had inflation and we've seen how it's responded to inflation. We have seen the European Union try and ban proof of work mining, which is Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin survived that. Uh, we had the truckers in Cape Town, the, the, the truckers who- In Canada. Had, in, Can in Canada, sorry, in <laughs> Canada. And they had their funds uh, confiscated from from one of those one of the sites, the GoFundMe site. And then people started to make donations in Bitcoin. And I actually read an article a little bit earlier today that the government were unable to confiscate the Bitcoin that, that were donated because they weren't sitting on a centralized exchange. So a lot of things have happened. We've also seen um, as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war, we've seen a couple of things. The first thing that we have seen is oh, wealthy and powerful the crypto community is. The crypto community have donated north of $100 million to Ukraine. And I think that that is one of the biggest, more than any country or very close to what any country in the world has donated. And this does show something. We have a community around the world of crypto people, which, which transcends any kind of geographical borders. And these crypto people have a lot of wealth behind them. And they are probably powerful or more powerful than some countries, if not most countries, when united. So we've seen this happen now. We've seen $100 million being given on the one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, we saw ridiculous sanctions being imposed on Russia and Russian oligarchs. And I say ridiculous because whereas I'm not a, someone who's going to delve into politics and decide whether sanctions are the right thing or not, it does feel like many Russians were sanctioned. Russians that weren't even living in Russia were, were completely sanctioned. And we saw something very interesting. And I, I want to show you something, if you'll allow me to share my screen. But this chart over here, this orange line here, this chart here is a chart of addresses with balances of a thousand or more Bitcoin in their wallets. OK, so the orange line shows you that these people have been selling, selling, selling. But then on the day of the sanctions, there was a spike in the number of wallets with a thousand Bitcoin or more. Now, what we think, what we what we speculate is that that is Russian oligarchs getting their money out of whatever they had it into and getting it out of the financial system because Bitcoin cannot be sanctioned. It cannot be, you cannot sanction Bitcoin. It's, there's no centralized entity. And so that is what we saw Bitcoin spike when that happened. Bitcoin went from, I think, I think around 36,000 to the first time that it went back over 40,000 uh, on the day uh, when that happened. And we're also seeing a huge adoption in Russia of USDT and USDC, which is a US backed, a USD backed uh, stablecoin. And so all these things, the Russia Ukraine war has shown many sides of Bitcoin. On the one hand, it's shown how powerful and how generous and how helping the crypto community is and how wealthy they are. On the other hand, we've seen how when push comes to shove and you need to escape the financial system, where it, where, where it may be for sanctions or for any other purpose. Well, Bitcoin is where people are going to be running to. And we're also seeing the Russians as the ruble devalues buying Bitcoin and buying um, a whole lot of these stable coins. So the Russia-Ukraine war has really shown the many sides of Bitcoin, the good, the bad and the ugly. And right. I think mostly the great. Well, let's touch on the fact that you said that it shows how people are able to escape sanctions or escape certain financial systems by moving to Bitcoin, by moving to crypto, because that has irked the likes of Senator Elizabeth Warren. And she is using that as a, as of the premise for stricter regulation against Bitcoin. What do you think is the result of that? Is there a way that that gets regulated? Um, Elizabeth, if we had to, if the market had to respond every time that Elizabeth Warren barked, we call her Senator Karen, I think uh, Elon Musk came <laughs> up, then it would be, a, I mean, would, it, it would be crazy. Elizabeth Warren has been on this, on this mission for a long time and, you know, she keeps shouting for more regulation and more regulation and more regulation. Uh, I watched her the other day and I'm sure many other people watched her the other day when she was speaking to one of the representatives from Chainalysis. And she didn't even listen to the answer. So, you know, she'll keep uh, she'll keep doing it. Remember that Joe Biden recently signed an executive order around crypto regulation. And if you read that executive order, there was a lot inside that executive order. For example, 
The first thing that it said in the executive order is that they recognize that the market is very big. The market has been to around $3 trillion. And at $3 trillion, you can't ignore this market. The second thing that they acknowledged in that executive order is they, they acknowledge that one in four households in the United States hold crypto. Now, one in four? One in four households in the United States hold crypto, which is crazy because if you think about why one in four households is holding crypto, it is because they believe that they're going to make money or that they want to be involved in this new blockchain movement, which is Web 3.0, which is the most exciting thing since probably the launch of the internet back in the 90s. And right now, it would be political suicide to try and ban crypto because you've got one in four households holding this, hoping that this thing's going to go up. So now I think it is pretty much impossible to ban crypto. Do hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel.